Hey, what's up, everybody? Sujin here. I've got some awesome people here, uh, Nate and David from Inbox Attack. Um, today, we're going to talk about screenwriting tactics to write better emails. Um, and I could go on about how awesome these guys are, uh, but you've probably seen a few uh, the last a few months ago a webinar with these guys. They did live rewrites at the very end, uh, and they walk you through start to finish, kind of how to use uh, Mailshake and how to do you know, some tools and how to write. Um, some really awesome email. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass it over to, to Nate. And uh, before I jump in real quick, this webinar is recorded. So uh, don't worry if you can't hang around for the whole thing. All right, Nate, kick it off. All right, welcome. So today we're digging into screenwriting. And the background story behind this is I was it was 2008 and I went to a film school for screenwriting and it was it was pretty pretty awesome and it was also really hard <laughs> and one of the things that was mind-blowing about the experience this is right before I started small biz triage and and got into the marketing space to begin with. And is there's learning that stories, for as fluffy as they may seem, have a lot of structure underneath them. That there are actually rules to good stories. There's rules to good stories. And some of these rules have been around for thousands of years. So we're gonna dig into a lot of these rules as they apply to screenwriting and films, and then how to take those concepts and apply them to emails, whether you're selling a product or a service or trying to get an influencer to pay attention to you. These tactics work regardless of what you're doing. And we're gonna look over some of the rules and which of the rules you should definitely follow and which ones you could afford to bend or break. Another big thanks to Mailshake for giving me a podium to stand on and talk about the stuff that I talk way too much about. <laughs> All right. The second half of this webinar, we are going to do a live rewrite. A live rewrite of some emails submitted during the webinar, meaning that when we see them, it'll be my first time seeing them, just to add to the add to the drama. We'll get into the, the concept of raising the stakes a little later in the deck. So go ahead, and if you've got something you're working on that's, that's not feeling right or not working on your prospects, go ahead and shoot a copy of that to david at inboxattack.com. All right, it's a little bit about me that you'll see in the replay. David's the guy behind the scenes that does all the heavy lifting uh, with Small Biz Triage and with our new product, Inbox Attack. He lives and breathes and eats cold emails. And during the Q&A session, he's going to be jumping in to respond to a lot of the gnarlier questions. Today, we're going to start out talking about the hero's journey. That's Those are the old rules and still the new rules that applied today. Then we're gonna dig into story structure, some of the the rules, and it almost there's a lot of graphs and charts involved in story structure. I'm gonna to try to keep that pretty short, but the structure is so important, the skeleton, the bones of the story, as Victor Hugo described it. Then we're gonna dig into tricks of the trade, things that, frankly, it's the fun stuff, the stuff that I use every day when I write emails. And then we're gonna dig into some live rewrites and open up the Q&A. All right, hero's journey. Joseph Campbell was a mythologist and he went and studied stories from the beginning of time all the way to present and came up with this, this idea of a monomyth. And the monomyth is the elements of a story that are able to survive through time. So regardless of what was culturally going on in the world, the, this the mythology, the structure behind it, the characters, the arc, the sequencing of how things happened 
is the same across the board. That's why I see similarities between stories told in, in Norse mythology and Greek mythology and in Roman mythology. It's there because that is how our brains are wired. So on an evolutionary perspective, we actually have developed brains that are wired for, for myth and is this mythological structure. Hero's Journey is used in all of the great movies. It doesn't just have to be a classic movie like Batman or Star Wars or Indiana Jones. You see it in a well-written romantic comedy. You'll see it in novels. You'll see it in a well-crafted Super Bowl commercial. The Hero's Journey. So let's dig into this. So I apologize for the, the grittiness of this chart. We're going to go through it pretty quick here. So in any hero's journey, they start in an ordinary world. So the hero's there, and the ordinary world is not to be confused with a bad world. So that's a, that's a problem we see a lot is when people send emails to their to a potential client, they're trying to paint this picture like they're going to die unless they buy this product. But the hero's journey, it's the, the, the devil you know. The ordinary world is where you, where you came from. The call to adventure is like, hey, you need to get out of your comfort zone and do something awesome. In most typical stories, the hero is going to be like, nope, I don't want to do that. That's too different. And eventually they'll meet with someone who's been through it before the mentor and it's like all right fine fine i'll go on this big adventure and, and step out of my comfort zone they cross a threshold they meet friends they meet enemies lord of the rings is a great example of this and then they approach something called the cave scene where all of their friends and allies drift away and they're by themselves battling the the villain so this goes on for a bit and then they finally get the reward. This could be the ring. This could be a lightsaber. This could be a potion. This could be your product. Then they go back with this awesome new thing and say, hey, old world, look at this new thing I have. And now I'm going to transform my old world into a new world. And during that last section, it's a bit of a rebirth. And the reason this is important is when you're doing the... Uh, Conducting sales in general, trying to convince people to do something that's out of their comfort zone, it usually requires change. There's there's some level of commitment that, yes, you're going to go through change. And the sooner you understand that that's what's going on in their brains at a very deep-rooted psychological level, the easier it's going to be to break through the noise and actually get them to do something, to get them to, to cross the threshold. Okay. The hero's journey is also composed of similar characters. There's the hero, which we all know, the shadow, otherwise known as the villain, the mentor, someone that helps them. The mentor's been through, they've been a hero before. They're like a retired hero. The ally, that could be the friends, that could even be a sidekick. The herald, who is someone that helps him cross the threshold and is more of a, an, an announcer, if you will. There's the shapeshifter, someone that actually possesses hero and villain qualities, the trickster. And I'm, yeah, it's Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> it's as simple as I gotta explain the trickster. And then you've got the guardian. So what's important for emails is those bottom ones, I think it's important to understand where they fit into stories. And it really helps when you're doing longer version stuff like pitch decks. But for an email, you need to be focused on the hero, the shadow, and the mentor. In some cases, the mentor and the ally can be interchangeable depending upon your personality and the relationship with the prospect. All right. Here's how the hero's journey applies to email. Number one, you are not the hero. When your prospect reads the email, 
they need to envision themselves as the hero. You are the mentor. You are the one that say, hey, I've been through, I've tackled this, this, this problem before and went through all the pain of trying to get these two things to integrate or to figure out how to get this person to, to buy something or any sort of challenge. And they guide you through the process. You are the mentor in that. The elixir, which was in that earlier slide, that's the lightsaber. That is the product or the service. So ultimately the elixir is what you're selling, but they need to trust that you are the trusted advisor or the mentor. And the villain is typically competitors. You know, your competitors or their competitors based whether it's a B2B or a B2C email. Number two, you need to raise the stakes. Throughout any good story, any good story, there's this concept of, okay, there's this villain, <clears throat> there's this problem in front of you, and that's this fire. And what you need to do is you need to push the prospect closer to the fire. Push them closer to the fire. And the easy way to do this is you make the positive more positive and the negative more negative. And we'll get into some examples of that when we do the live rewrites, but that that's the, I, I would write that down on a post-it note and, and tape it to your monitor because I use that in emails every single day. Make the positive more positive and the negative more negative. You need to raise the stakes. In marketing, they call this creating a sense of urgency, but in storytelling, it's a whole lot more. And finally, embrace conflict. So often I see emails like, hey, if you've got the time and I hope I'm not troubling you too much. No, the, the, the point of a, a good story, when someone reads this, they're like, wow, I could be a hero in this story. And if I buy this product, I can vanquish my enemies. If I, if I take this consultant's advice, I could do something amazing with my life. So the, the goal is to actually incite some emotion. Now you can incite any kind of emotion, but don't be afraid to incite a little emotion. In some cases it requires controversy. In some cases it requires shock and awe. In other cases it requires you sharing some of your own experience, some of your own story where you may have messed something up or had a big public fail. Another aspect of embracing conflict is you need to spotlight the villain. And that's similar to pushing their feet closer to the fire. Now, here's the kicker. The villain is sometimes your prospect. And many, many of the best stories and movies, we see that, that the villain, the person that we think is the villain, ends up becoming the hero or, or gathering hero-like qualities. The end of Star Wars with Darth Vader. You know, he saved the sun in the last moments. Now, with your prospects, the people you're emailing, the people you're trying to convince to do something, oftentimes it's just their own bad habits. It's their own lack of knowledge. It's fear. So in, in this case, they, they are their own worst enemy. And a lot of good films and good stories and good marketing doesn't spotlight a villain as, as a character, but more as that internal struggle. All right, now we're going to dig into story structure. Story structure. Robert McKee is probably one of the screenwriting professors out there. He travels all over the world. And this stuff, I'll admit, could get a little dense. This is just one of probably 100 plus graphs that he has in his books. Now, I want to go over this one just a moment. Now, notice raising the stakes is built in there. Raising the stakes is built in there. Another thing that that he introduced, and he basically took the hero's journey, the the psychological and deep rooted ego, and and the portability of stories, and then he applied it into an almost mathematical formula. That's why so many blockbusters are so predictable. They have an inciting incident. Something bad happens, or something really good that becomes bad. Bad happens. It builds the stakes. It's like, oh, geez, there's, there's an 800-pound gorilla in the room. Let's bring in a T-Rex, too, just to raise the stakes. Oh, let's make that one velociraptor, two velociraptors. In business, that would be like, yeah, you know what? You've got a lot of competition. 
And oh, guess what? Congress just enacted a law to make your job even harder. It's raising the stakes. And then at the end, it's the climax. And in, in an email format, the climax is where is where you close them. It's like, I just got to step in a little farther here. Grab that, pull that sword from the stone. Dig into this. You know, conquer the fear, spend a little money, and and take my product and be the hero of your own story. All right. So that's that's story structure in a nutshell. One more thing, actually, I want to dig into here is the concept of value change. Value change. So if in the beginning of an email you're starting with something warm and fuzzy, you need to transition to something scary and negative and vice versa. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to go positive and end it negative. You just need to make sure that you change the value. So that, that's the, it's a way of creating contrast. We wanna create contrast. So that's why you spotlight the villain, and but you also upsell your product or service or offering or pitch. So you, if you spot, so that creates contrast. So it's like, wow, that is a really powerful sword. And well, the, yeah, that, that monster is really big. So when you put them next to each other in the frame, you're able to see that contrast. And this is something next to positive, more positive and negative, more negative. When you do both, you'll actually create contrast. That is the byproduct of good contrast. All right, here's the fun stuff. So here's my, in case of emergency, break glass tactics. And they usually work in email. I've used all sorts of screenwriting and, and movie tactics and tricks, and some of them have worked awesome, and some of them have totally tanked. All right, so, we need to get them moving. This is a this is the first clip from Breaking Bad, and oftentimes when you're writing about, especially like a SaaS product or a technology product, there is no motion. So if there's any way to get something moving, physically moving, so when you're talking about uh, a collaboration tool, for example, you're talking about a collaboration tool. So instead of saying, yeah, you know, from my desk, I could do this collaboration and it all integrates with stuff and it's awesome. Now, instead, yeah, in my old world, there's that, that mythology in the old world that I lived in too. And I've been through it already. I've already come through my hero's journey and I, I would sit at my desk and then I'd have to walk get up and try to find Denise in her cubicle to talk to her about this thing, then walk this thing over there, then email this thing. So any way you could get the characters or the objects moving, actual physical motion, they need to envision something's moving. Because what happens psychologically is they themselves start to move. And when you have a little of that momentum, the momentum could be redirected into a close. And this is, this is the most important one. In case of emergency, look at Pixar. At the moment, the films that Pixar makes and even some of the ill-advised ones like Cars 2, they are master storytellers. So those of you out there that have kids or behind closed doors, like, like enjoying a good Pixar film, Pixar, they, they are the experts in storytelling. Some of the things that you see them do a lot is they inject a lot of real traits in their characters. They inject humanity into their characters. So, and another thing that they do is they also stick to them. They, they stick to the mythology of the hero's journey to the T. You can look at any Pixar movie and identify the shadow and the guardian and, and, and the elixir. You can identify in the structure itself, the, the, the Robert McKee structure. You'll, you'll see the inciting incidents and the value change. Now, 
there, there's a scene in the Incredibles uh, when Dash is just running really, really fast. He's running and running and running. And he's super happy with himself because he's like, yeah, I totally uh, outran these guys. And he's like, woohoo! And then immediately, they don't wait. Pixar doesn't need to wait. Immediately, there's some dude waiting there for him. He's like, uh-oh. And he starts running again. So they are the experts. So when you're thinking and you get stuck on trying to add some narrative juice to your emails, trying to add a little more oomph, trying to make them less boring, refer back to your favorite Pixar movie. Mine's Mine happens to be The Incredibles. So... All right, it is time for some live rewrites. All right, let me get some. Okay. David. David has prepped a Google Doc for us. Get one sec here. I've got like four computers open right now. And while Nate does that, um, I want to just jump in to um, make sure everyone asks questions. We're going to do Q&A a little bit after this. So if you want to ask a question, um, either leave a comment with your question or click the ask a question button and just post your question. So uh, there you have it. We'll ask during the time and uh, we'll, we'll do these library rights right now. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna rewrite these emails that David queued. I have not seen these yet. So this is this is the real deal right now. David has raised the stakes on me <laughs> to perform in the moment. So I'm going to set a timer here so I don't go too long. All right, let's let me make this bigger. I think last time Okay, that should be better. All right, let's start at the top. Let's see can you point me in the right direction? Hi, first person. I am writing in hopes of finding the appropriate person who handles leadership development. I'll also wrote to Tom, Dick, and Harry in that pursuit. Are you struggling getting key leaders and teams working more cohesively? Is it also important to get them performing at a higher level? Our coaching process has been used worldwide by over 11,000 leaders with a 95% success rate. Over 150 of the Fortune 500 use our approach to help their leaders and teams perform at a higher level, including Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Toyota, and many more. Are you available for a call this week or next? Sincerely, Andy. Okay. So right out of the gate, we need to remember that we want to frame the person reading this email as the hero of the story, right? So opening up an email, now this, this format email a few years back was really, really effective. And in certain industries, it still works. So there's a lot of good going on in this email, but we're gonna look at it from a, from a hero's journey perspective, all right? So right off the bat, subject line, I'm kind of feeling like we need to spotlight the villain in the subject line. So let's start there. So, uh, expensive leader team communication, right? So that the, right now, not a perfect subject line, but we're, we're, we're spotlighting the villain. And if someone's looking at this as like, yeah, I just, we just totally tanked it on that project because the boss and the team weren't talking. The left hand wasn't talking to the right. So we could also frame it like this. Now it's a bit cliche, 
But notice left and right, that is a way of creating contrast. That's a way to create contrast. All right. All right. So and this, the opening here. So I'm almost thinking this just needs a little reordering. So I'm just going to pull this up. But we're going to, we need to frame Andy as the mentor. So we're spotlighting the villain. We need to frame Andy as the mentor. We need to frame the person he's sending this to, person A, as the uh as the hero, all right? So, I get it. Getting leaders. Effectively, it's hard, all right? Now, we raise the stakes. So getting leaders and their teams to communicate effectively, it's hard, right? I mean, communication is really hard. So, okay, so we just, we, we, we throw out the obvious. Now we need to raise the stakes. We need, we need to make the villain worse. We need to push them closer to the fire. And when your company is growing, Miscommunication and become sensitive, really, really sensitive. Now, I know I may sound a bit cheesy, and your prospects may not like that kind of language, but tactically, repeating a word is and repeat, repeating a phrase is psychologically effective. That's why you see it in TV commercials and radio commercials so much. Repetition is not a bad thing. That's another way of spotlighting something and creating more contrast. So right now, the villain, the villain right now is expensive miscommunication. Well, all miscommunication is expensive, but the ones that are really embarrassing. So, oh, and also be embarrassing All right so the reason adding something like that is is looking at humans in general we want to talk about hard value and soft value so in this case, God, that's a hard value, right? Like th this product, we're leading up to the fact that whatever this, whatever Andy is selling, is the hard value is it's gonna it's gonna save them from expensive mistakes. That's the hard value. The soft value is it will eliminate or, or reduce potentially embarrassing situations. And for me, this is the stronger motivator. That's the thing. That's that's the the demon. That's the villain I'm most scared of on a personal level. All right. Uh, now asking questions. I, I I try to avoid asking too many questions in emails. I usually just try to keep it to one. And this question down here does it just fine. I'm going to leave that as is. All right. So let's go in a bit deeper here. Now now what we need to do is I like this phrase higher level. Uh, so one of the, the aspects of the mentor is the mentor typically has helped more than one hero along their path. And they, they've been through it before they have experience. Past, say, eight years. Coached. My spelling is way off today. Here we go. And all 
All right, so this line here. I'm writing in hopes of finding the appropriate person who handles leadership development. Keep in mind the person you're emailing, even if they're not the right person, they still have a desire to be the hero. They still have the desire to be the hero. So we're going to rewrite this as uh, team at and then company name. Uh, feet. The use of the word feet also very deliberate. It's very deliberate. Okay. Now this in here, this is so we've already spotlighted the villain. We made the negative more negative. We've framed Andy as a mentor. Now that now that here's the call to adventure. Hey, I think I could help you and your team do the same thing. All right. Now, if they really, if they're interested, they will forward the email off or they reply and say, you need to talk to this person instead. I usually don't ask people in emails, hey, send me to the right person. Because a well-written email, if you, if you put in enough details about specific problems, like if we had this thing narrowed by industry, we'd be able to spotlight a very specific problem or even call one out. That's a way to get people moving. It's like, yeah, so as I'm running running down the hallways of my my biggest clients buildings trying to stop John from 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 giving that presentation because he has the wrong deck on the USB stick and I, I blast through the doors to try to stop him so that's that's a way to get it moving I don't have information on that right here but that's a way you could do it uh now right here that this is actually good writing right here I like this has been used worldwide by over 11,000 leaders 95 percent success rate uh See, over 150 of the Fortune 500 use our approach to help their leaders and teams clean out. This is excellent. Now, if you know the industry these people are in, I would use examples relevant to their industry. So, and that's something that when you input it into a, a spreadsheet before putting it into Mailshake, personalizing the name dropping per industry is crazy effective at getting people to like, oh, wow, you do understand my world. And I want to be a hero like Steve Jobs or whoever owns J&J &J and Toyota. All right. Are you available for a call this week or next? Sincerely. Bum, bum, bum. All right. So there's one. Do a little time check. Okay. All right. So let's go into email two. See, hey, David, you may have seen a LinkedIn request come through for me earlier this week. I'm reaching out from Wade and Wendy, a conversational recruiting platform powered by AI. Are you free for a 15 minute introduction? If so, feel free to grab some time directly on my calendar. All right, I'm gonna go Star Wars on this one. I, I told myself as I don't go to Star Wars today, but I need to go Star Wars on this one. The reason why is this line right here. Conversational recruiting platform powered by AI. Do they ever explain in Star Wars how a lightsaber works? Do they ever actually explain? Do they spend any screen time in like the nine or 12 movies they've done in the Star Wars universe? Have they ever explained how a lightsaber works? It's probably super fancy science stuff, and I'm sure there's some people that have theorized how it would work, and there's people that have tried to build them. But th this is a, a case. This is in marketing. You talk about uh, you know sell the benefits, not the features. That is something that also is really important in in storytelling. Uh, one of the rules, my my screenwriting professor used to always hammer on me on was, was show, don't tell. Right now we're telling them this is what this thing is, not the impact that it makes. So when you're trying to, to frame someone as the hero of their own story, they need to know that they're talking to someone that can hand them a weapon or a tool or some high octane fuel 
to to make a bigger impact in their lives in their business in their homes now it sounds cool and sometimes having something cool sounding so this might be more appropriate later on in the email uh but it, it doesn't talk about the impact and i don't know what what a conversational recruiting pl platform powered by ai is i'm guessing it'll make recruiting easier uh, maybe it'll help them reach out to more people i've been a recruiter before that was my job before becoming a marketing geek and copywriter so I, I was a recruiter. Now, this would be pretty nice to be able to reach out to a lot of folks, but it also opens up a lot of questions. Hey, are we talking artificial intelligence? You know, our, so with this one here right off the bat, if you want to keep it short, and I think someone asked this question in the, in the message thread in Crowdcast uh, earlier today that I already answered. But what we could do with that is right out of the gate, just if you, if you want to keep it short and go, get straight to the point, I have a tool to index your recruitment efforts at home. So you could just jump right into the sea and say, you know, I've got the goods. And then we could do some mentor framing here. Companies like Blank. So we name drop a couple of people that have already completed their hero's journey that are known in the public eye. And name calling there, Wade and Wendy, that could just be in the signature block if they want to know that. All right. Now, one of the things tough in this kind of an email is I, I mentioned the importance of value change, of, of creating contrast. Uh, so that would give us a chance to actually talk about the cool nerdy stuff, which it is cool. I'm not trying to downplay a, a conversational platform powered by robots or something. That's That actually is cool. We had plenty of robots in Star Wars, too. So after... With inconsistent, so they were spotlighting the vil, uh, uh, inconsistent recruitment years. I maybe join forces. I, I I developed a super squad. I partnered. Geniuses. All right, now I'm going to actually, when it comes to formatting and emails, think about what you could do with the actual, like what word you want to stick out. You know, the Powered by AI is, AI is cool because it's it's more scalable. You don't have to have a body babysit it. It makes sense. People, Whoever you're reaching out to probably already knows that. But it's a conversational recruiting platform. Maybe it's a bot. Maybe it's I don't know anything about it. But but that's the type of thing. Huh? Conversational recruiting. I uh, incited a little bit of curiosity. And conversational also incites emotion. And it may pull up a, a negative emotion as like, oh, those interviews I had to do, the pre-screen questionnaires I had to do. Oh, it was just soul crushing. How many idiots that got, got lined up? that made it through the pre-screen process that should never have gotten scheduled for an in-person interview. People that we missed that are, that are competition scooped up because we were too slow. So you don't necessarily need to list that stuff off, although it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt to identify all the bad guys in the room. Okay. Uh, now I do like this line, by the way, are you free for a 15 minute introduction? It's a yes, no question. And it's very specific. It's very specific. And stories, even though structurally they are they, they, they share the same DNA, 
the specifics is what is what is different. That's why you could see things and they and they look completely different, but they feel the same. So we're trying we're trying to to, to do both. Now, if so, feel free to grab some time directly in my calendar. I use this line all the time in emails, and I love it. So, I uh, another thing that we could do with this is, uh is we could create some motion. So now that we've perfected it internally, an adaptable platform. So our companies So that creates a little, so so I partnered up with someone. So this shows a bit of a timeline. It was like, first this happened, then this happened, then this other thing happened. And that's something that Pixar is always hammering uh, their screenwriters and their storytellers on is, is, is there needs to be some form of a sequence. First this, then this, then this, then something crazy happens and makes them sad. And then they find this awesome mentor that guides them along the way to get into this cool product or service. And now they're happy. So there's a sequence and there's those value changes, happy to sad, scared to brave, uh, anxious to courageous. All right. So let's take another time hack here. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through this one a bit fast and so I could leave a good solid 10 minutes on, on Q and a, all right, last one. Feed technology, this is a cool email. We could read it here. Uh, all right, I'm just gonna highlight a few goods and bads here. All right, the, uh, it's cheaper and faster than building and house. That's good. That is a really, really good line. That did that, what it does is it's cheaper and faster. I would avo avoid the use of the word cheap maybe more affordable. Uh, cheap just has a lot of psychological connotations that'll actually devalue the product when it comes time for them to actually pay for it. But having these listed off like this and cheaper and faster and more awesome and easier to use and et cetera, et cetera, than building in-house. And that also building in-house, so this is describing their old world. So this is the world you're around in now. And I know you've probably been annoyed by this, but haven't had a way to get out of that old world. You haven't had a vehicle to get you out of there. And let's see here. Good name dropping here. Like, are leveraging our solution as they saw the exceptional value of outsourcing. Okay. Name dropping is good. Here's all the other people that have helped become heroes with this awesome weapon or tool. So, so we're going from very human conversation here. And now we're getting into kind of corporate speak, leveraging our solution. They saw the exceptional value of outsourcing their feed technology. Uh, heroes are also humans. So think about how that would be said conversationally. How would you rephrase that, the phrase at converse? If you're saying that to a person on the street or in a line at a coffee shop, how would you phrase it so that they would understand? All right, so check out our features page for an overview of our offered solutions. You know, it's uh, give this a test drive or dig in a little farther. Hey, come over this hill and so you could get a view of all the stuff that we got. I say, would you be willing to give up 15 to 30 minutes to chat about a possible use case? So it is a yes, no question. That's good. Uh, but would you be willing to give up Someone that's been a hero before, it comes off just a smidgen desperate. Uh, you could just straight up say that, keep in mind, inciting emotion. All right. And and being bold with the story. You know, heroes have to make decisions. Now, let, let's talk for 15 min minutes to see if we could, I can, I can map out a possible use case over the phone in 15 minutes. Schedule it here. 
I'm not going to make you make you wait because the hero's journey at, at its core is scary. Change is scary. So even though you want to spotlight the villain and and frame yourself as the mentor, it is really, really important that there, there's still that guardian at the threshold. That's one of the characters in, in, in the hero's journey. There's still that guardian there because they're, the, the hero needs help. They need several people helping them. And sometimes they don't have that. So you're the one, the mentor, and also maybe the ally. Yeah, I'll walk you through the process. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but we'll find out on a phone call. It's worth looking. All right. Okay. I'm going to stop talking and get into some Q&A. Awesome, dude. I'll give you a little break. Uh, I'll lead off the Q&A. Um, first and foremost, uh, it looks like you answered some of the questions, but um, let's say you're targeting, let's say you're targeting a specific industry, right? Uh, somebody asked about the HR industry or HR tech. How would you change um, the messaging based off who you're targeting? Nate, did I lose you? No, you didn't. <laughs> I, when you're dealing with adjusting targeting, think about the difference between being relatable to your prospect and talking over your prospect. The, the goal of the mentor is to actually frame themselves as somebody that's already been through it. They've already been through it. So dropping in a little industry jargon or again, like recruiting the, the phrase purple squirrel is common, but a lot of people out of recruiting don't know it. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I've hunted purple squirrels for a living before. I've been where you're at before. Uh, but the, the danger of that is when you're going after a, a bigger list or maybe you don't know the job title of the person you're reaching out to, you need to downgrade it into more universal language, which is where the story structure comes into play because the structure of the story is universal. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Now, when you're thinking about, um, you know, less is more and really, you know, shorter kind of emails, I always, you know, my, my take is I always try to be short and to the point. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think people uh, struggle with like, what's too short? What's, what, what's too long? Like, I guess, like, what's your, in your opinion, what's a good length of an email? I get that question in every single webinar I teach. <laughs> uh, the short answer is the higher up the food chain you go. So if you're going from managers to directors to VPs to CXOs, the higher up the food chain, the shorter the email needs to be. And it's less of a byproduct, uh, byproduct of uh, of a tactic or the psychology. It's more a byproduct of the fact that the people you're reaching out to are really that busy. So it's more respectful to give them bite-sized pieces. And you can also piece together a good story arc in multiple emails and multiple conversations. So you don't have to get through the whole beginning, middle and end. You could do a beginning. I mean, you see this with a good drip campaign. I strongly discourage people from targeting like a VPs or, or CEOs with a drip campaign. But if done manually, you could break it up in chapters. It doesn't have to all happen at once. Now, that being said, Long form still works. It still works. 
especially if it's a, uh, a story, a uh, customer testimonial story. Uh, we've tested this uh, in email newsletters and in certain audiences, they like to read. They like to read. So as long as there's a beginning, a middle and an end, some inciting incident, something's happening, something's moving, then you could afford to be long. If you're just saying, hey, I've got a cool tool, to a better wrench to fix your tire, you don't necessarily have enough meat to justify a you know, five-course meal. And we also see that with Facebook ads. Our, uh, our Facebook ads partner has been testing short Facebook ads versus really long ones. And in some audiences, the long ones crush it. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I've got a couple more questions and then uh, we'll let you guys go. All right. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, when you're emailing a little bit older demographics, uh, when you're emailing folks that maybe have uh, like just an older industry that maybe offline or whatnot, how would you, how would you kind of structure things? Like is the email very different? No, I wouldn't actually. Now, I might push the call to action farther up in the email. Because in the older generation, I find they get a bit impatient with any salesmanship happening. They're not averse to it. They just, it's not their style. They don't have the, the capacity for digging through a long pitch. So there's like, hey, let's just get on the phone. So I might offer up a shortcut. Like, hey, you could skip to the end and just shoot me a call uh, or keep reading. So you, you could actually give like your two calls to action, similar oh, calls to action, but put it up top. So it's like, hey, just you could just shoot me a call here. Here's what I'm about. So the people that are more phone friendly have that shortcut. You're just making it easier on them. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, so quick follow-up question to the previous question from Kip uh, around um, the the uh, the emails and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. what um, what you know in terms of which audience or uh, kind of role in the organizations? What 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 types of emails do you like to read? Like CXOs, um, do you like long forms or VPs? Like short form? You know, I guess like my my gut tells me. Um, my gut tells me the shorter the, the the higher up the person, the shorter the emails they like. But is that is that accurate, or am I just making that up in my head? Uh, it's a good rule of thumb. Uh, one of the things I've seen that's been effective is outside of email, but it's a similar psychological exchange, a conversational exchange, is leaving voicemails. So there's two schools of thought with leaving a voicemail, very similar to a cold email. It's you leave a really short one. It's like, I have something really exciting I want to talk to you about. Shoot me a call here. All intrigue, all curiosity. But everyone else is using that too. So, so you could choose to call me back or not. I'm just going to let you know what I'm about, how I think I could help you. And you can decide whether or not it's worth the call. Here's my number. And then you give them a pitch. Like some people will leave voicemails that are like two or three minutes long and get crazy good results. Because someone could just be sitting there and as long as it's well structured and there's some beginning and middle and end. And it, it doesn't have to be all features, features, features. It could be just a story. Hey, I was sitting down with the CEO of XYZ company the other day and this topic came up and I thought, you know what? I think that this is even more relevant to your company, John Smith. I'd love to hop on the call and dig into it. Specifically, I'd like to cover X, Y, and Z. And I think that we may have a way to help you solve A, B, and C problems. Here's my number. So instead of them having to make a call and be disappointed, it's almost like a cold email 
in a voicemail format, but you need to give them enough information to say yes to. They can't all be intrigue. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. All right. We got one more question and then we'll let you guys go. And I feel like you're going to say you get this question a lot. So ready for it? Yeah. This is uh, the age old question of how many follow ups and what time frame is acceptable? Like, what is, what's your take on this? I know it's a loaded question. Follow ups. All right. Center of bullseye, B2B cold em emails. I would say three days after the first email, you should resend the email to anyone that didn't open the first one. And then a week after that, send an email to anyone that opened but didn't click the first and second attempt. Click a reply. So it's, it's based off segmentation more than it is a follow-up. And honestly, don't be afraid of the phone. That's a great email too if you're sending to the same list is you email and then you call and then you text and then you email again. You could reference the call in your email. It could just be a one-liner. Hey, I left you a voicemail about this, that, and the other. Uh, let's get some time on the calendar and flesh it out a bit. And that could be a short email. So you could get really short with follow-up emails, but you need to leave enough ingredients on the table to make a full meal in that first email. And that could be done in a very compact way. You could get it done in five sentences. You just need to be very hyper aware of those root concepts, you know, framing them as the hero, framing your product as the elixir, you as the wise mentor, and then call to action, the call to adventure. Is, is, so you could get that done in five sentences if you wanted to. Got it. Awesome. All right. So that is it. That's the last, uh, that's the last question. Um, Nate, David, where can people find you? What's the, where do they go? That's two ways. You can email David at inboxattack.com. Yeah, you can go to our website, inboxattack.com. Uh, and our, our agency that does a lot of MailShake and MailChimp work is Small Biz Triage. So S-M-A-L-L-B-I-Z-T-R-I-A-G-E.com. That's where we do the done for you services and some of the more structured monthly recurring stuff for uh, e-commerce clients and B2B clients that are doing regular campaigns. Awesome. And you had a slight echo this whole time, which was just awesome because it just reiterated the powerfulness of what you were saying. So <laughs> I was like, it's like the voice of God telling me how to do email. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> all good. All right. Thanks again. And uh, hey, everyone on the webinar, this is recorded. You can check it out. With, uh, you can come back to this anytime using the same exact link. And um, again, we probably will have David and Nate back on here at some point in the future. All right, guys, take care. All right, thanks.